All right. So, today, I want to talk about using uh, groups of, of sources together. So ways of, so, it, you know, generally, um, when you're working with SPAT or most um, uh, panning systems, we have a virtual source, right? And we move the virtual point source around in space. And that's, that's cool, but it's also, it's a single, it's a single source. And in the world, of course, we have, you know, you know, I'm tapping on this table, but the table is resonating and the table exists in space and things are all kind of coupled together. There's many, it's a rich, uh, you know, analog acoustic world. And, um, and so it's, that's partially explains why the natural world is so much more nuanced and textured when it comes to, to, um, you know, our experience of listening to a, you know, walking in the forest with, uh, in, on dry leaves is vastly more detailed than we could probably ever really recreate with, um, with virtual sources. Um, and part of that is because there's just so many things that are vibrating. And so, kind of inspired by that, I started working with um, groups of sounds. And as a way to try to um, create a kind of gesture, a, a kind of presence, a spatial presence. Because, you, you know, you can make a gesture that, of a sound moving through space. You could have a single point and design a very complex, um, you know, spiraling and, and all this stuff. But at some point, it's, it's a single point that is moving through space. And so I think it's pretty interesting to start thinking about how do you deal with a group of sources and populate them all, or how do you deal with a group of sources? And generally, I'm working with, um, well, I've developed some techniques for, that I, I was talking about earlier today, this sort of Boyd's flocking algorithm thing, where I'm populating a cloud of points with a single mono sound and then generating a kind of spatial image from that. So I want to go through, basically build up um, towards that today. So what I'm going to start with is taking the calibration patch that we made last time and putting it into a new patch. So first thing I'm going to do is encapsulate everything up here. So I have my speaker coordinates. I pack them into the speaker's AED format. Sorry for this cable there. Speaker's AED. Then remember, we, we rotated everything because we wanted the, the screen to be forward. And we added this o.var because spat transform, by default, when you spend the, send the speaker coordinates in, it will also send out a bunch of non-full packet OS, like pseudo OSC messages. And so to avoid that, dealing with that, we just put an o.var in there, and that converts everything to a bundle. And then we add the number of, source, or number of speakers we have and the number of sources. Um, so I'm going to just encapsulate all of that, shift command E, and call it uh, an init, it's short for initialization. Um, it takes the whatever is there, and it if it's not an OSC bundle, it makes a bundle. So we're probably still going to use spat opera, so we can leave that here. We use spat spat. So we're going to use pretty much everything here. I'm just going to delete this stuff over here. Try to clean this up. Um, I'm going to encapsulate the gains. Let's call this gain in it and delay in it. Okay. Can you show people 
Yeah, so that is you select some things. So I'm going to encapsulate, encapsulate these two things, and I'm doing Shift Command E for encapsulate. You can also go to the Edit menu and choose Encapsulate down here. Okay. Start with a clean patch. Okay. So here's so here over here is a patch that we can start to send sound to speakers. What's in here? Um, okay. So here's that LFO thing we made. Um, I'm gonna delete that for now. I'm gonna delete the calibrate because we did that already. Okay. So now we have we have some open space here. You encapsulated so fast I missed what went into all of. Oh, okay. uh, well, this is all from um, the other day. So the first one is the speaker coordinates up to up to here. If you if you grab the file from yesterday, it's called Studio One Setup. It's this one right here. Oh, we have it. It just encapsulated so fast, people mm -hmm. couldn't see what you put in. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so everything through everything before stat got to put in there. Exactly. This stuff up here. I'm going to continue moving. I, I can come back to it, but actually, for, for a moment, I'm going to talk about uh, jitter, because jitter is a, is a useful way for, um, for generating points. So just to start, let's make a new object, jit.noise. Jit.noise creates um, random numbers in a jitter matrix. A jitter matrix is a, think of it as a table of numbers that has a number of rows and columns. And in each column, there can be a number of, or sorry, in each cell, so that's a group of cells that has a, a number of rows and a number of columns. And in each cell, there can be planes, which are a bunch of numbers that are bundled together in the cell. Um, so it's very typical when working in Jitter in Max to use uh, the planes to represent coordinates uh, when you're using OpenGL or something like that. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to say JIT noise. And then we're going to give an argument of three. That means there are three planes. I can zoom in a little bit here. So JIT noise three, float 32. That's the type of number that we want. And now I'm just going to make a list of, let's say, let's make 16 numbers. And it's going to be a 16 by 1 matrix. So it's basically a list of 16 values. And a useful tool for viewing jitter things is jit.p window, which makes this black square. And if you plug in the jitter into it and send it a bang, we get a bunch of lines. The reason that they're lines is that we're, we're actually just, we just have 16 cells. You can see there's 16 colors here. And every time I click this, it makes a new random um, collection of numbers. Another um, way to see the values inside a jitter matrix is to use jit.cellblock. This will, by default, show you one, the first plane. If you send it a plane minus one message, it gives you all three planes at the same time. It's cutting off most of that last value there. Um, I'm going quickly here just so we can get to everything. Did that work? That didn't change the size. Um, column width, there we go. So I just went to the inspector, and I'm increasing the column width a little bit. This is just to show you that we have, in each cell, there are three planes that have three random numbers. These random numbers 
I believe, go between zero and one. OK, so now we have a bunch of, we're generating a bunch of random points um, between zero and one. So how do we, how do we use that? So jitter is cool because you can, you can do a lot of things. You can, you can operate on these values in jitter. Um, I'm going to not focus on that so much today. This is just a kind of basic um, starting point. But there are many tools for manipulating um, uh, matrices in jitter. But we're, what we want to do is pull the, these numbers out and put it into spat. We want to use this to control spatial locations. And we're going to use it to control some other processes, like basically building up a Boyd's patch that I was, like what I would do for a Boyd's thing. So how do we get this data out? My favorite way is to use jit.spill. And jit.spill sends out um, all of one plane at a time for the whole matrix. So you need to give it, we want all three values because we're going to use this to be x, y, z coordinates. So you want to spill plane 0, plane 1, and plane 2. The, the numbering starts at 0. So for the first plane, for the first spill, we'll say jit spill plane 0. And now if you put a regular max message and look at the output of that, you'll see that it's the first number of the cell block. So the first number is 0.69, next one is 0.88, and you can see in the cell blocks that that's the same thing there. So I'm going to use spit, spill for plane 1, for 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And then I'm going to make it o.pack and label these as x, y, and z. Now I'm taking advantage of the fact that, you know, in max things go from right to left. So I'm, um, I'm sending a bunch of things out of one outlet. So I know that the thing coming to JIT spill 2 is going to happen first, then plane 1, then plane 0. And I know that JIT, uh, o.pack sends its bundle out when it gets something in its leftmost inlet. So I know that these three values are going to be synchronized here. If I were more pedantic, I might use a trigger here to make sure that my order of operations is consistent. But we're not going to do that, even though it's better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh -huh. Would you have to use the trigger FFF because they're loads? No, because they're not floats. Oh, okay. Because what's coming out of, of the jitter matrix, actually, let's look at, if we put a max message there and go into the right inlet, uh -huh. it says jit matrix. Oh, okay. So it's, it's kind of like a full packet in a way. It's a identifier of what type of thing is coming through and a address of a, it's a wrapped yeah. memory address, basically. That's existing, being stored by this jit.noise object. Right, cool. um, OK, so once we've spilt all of the planes of our matrix and we put them into the o.pack, we can then use an o.compose object here. And now we have a bunch of numbers. <laughs> And now, so now let's let's go to spat. Let's go into our our initialization sub patch. So this is from yesterday. We have our speaker coordinates transformed that gets sent into here, and then we are um, putting in the number of speakers and the number of sources. Now we're going to have 16 sources. So I'm going to change that number there to be 16. So source slash number equals 16. Note that there's no comma at the end of that, as usual, in no, doubt, no comma at the end. 
So now, if you've clicked on that, you should see in SPET Opera now 16 sources along with all of the speaker coordinates. Exactly, yeah. So here I put source number equals 16 instead of 2. And then I clicked on this a bunch of times. And now I clicked on the initialization because, I, well, we could actually fix that. So actually, we want the, we want to tell SPAT how many number of things we have before we send out the the speaker coordinates because it needs to know how many speakers it has before it knows what to do with the speaker coordinates. So in here, I'll do a trigger bang bang. So when a bang comes in, it's going to first send the number of speakers and the number of sources to SPAT. So sp down here is um, to SPAT upper. That's where I know that the outlet here is attached to SPAT opera. And so I'm going to first, so we get a bang in here. It's going to go into this trigger and first come out of the rightmost outlet. And then when, when an O.dot expert code box gets a bang, it's, it evaluates whatever's in there. Um, and here, so it's going to create a new uh, OSC address speaker number and assign the number 32 to it. And then it does the same thing for source number 16. So then that will go out to SPAT Opera and set the numbers. And then it will bang this list of speaker coordinates, prepend speakers AED, and rotate it um, negative 90 degrees to the left. And so that will avoid having to um, click bang or, or to click on that multiple times. OK, right, so now we have 16 sources. So now we want to get these x, y, z values that were randomly generated and put them into SPAT. So we need to format this, these lists of coordinates to something that SPAT can, can understand. So we know these are um, sources. So what we can do is use o.expertcodebox. And there's a message for SPAT that SPAT understands, which is sources, plural, followed by a format, which is now XYZ. And it wants a list, a, a uh, list of triplets of interleaved X, Y, and Z coordinates. And there's a ODOT function called interleave where I can now pass in x, y, and z, and it will do that for us. I think. Yep. So you see now in our, in our bundle, we have x, y, z, and sources x, y, z which is a, takes each element of the list and, and weaves them together so that we have a, a sequence of x, y, z uh, coordinates in the list. Um, it's really useful to have the, these values as separate addresses. So having a separate list for x, a separate list for y, a separate list for z, because then you can operate on these, these coordinates in terms of their, or it's, it's just easier to operate on the list of coordinates when they're separated. If they're always together, it's hard to know, it's hard to operate on it because you, they're all interleaved. And so then what do you, if you, you know, how do you, how do you scale the x when they're multiplied? You'll have to then uninterleave them, scale it, and re-interleave them. So we don't want to do, we don't want to do that. But SPAT prefers um, either it wants um, source slash, so, so the two main ways, so we can say sources x, y, z, just to give an example. Oh. Okay. 
Oh, wait, you know what I should do? I'm going to make a... <laughs> okay. Well, now I know. Uh, this way, I know where not to go in my patch. Because okay. I'm not. I'm not really. Oh, right. Yeah. I'm not really looking up at the screen very much. Okay. You can send either a list of coordinates using the plural sources, or you can send an individual coordinate. So, for instance, if we send source one, x, y, z and we say negative 10, 0, 0. Oh, no. <laughs> How am I going to remember that? I don't know. OK. So we can address a single source by, by using a, a singular word source with an ID number followed by a format type and then a list. Remember that a list in ODOT is single brackets when you are creating a list, comma-separated list. Um, or you can use sources, plural, without an index, and send in a list of interleaved values. You can also th note that I don't know what happens if your list of sources is not the same as the number of sources that the spat object you're sending it to is expecting. If it's less, I don't know what would happen. Um, another thing you can do, so let's just, I'm going to click on this and now open spat opera, and we can see that source one is now negative 10 from the center. Right? So we just set that here. It's source one, x, y, z, there. Now we can also, a cool thing about, um, oh, shoot. Um, ah, got myself in a pickle here. All right. So a cool thing about OSC is that it has a wild card. Now, there's a complication in ODOT expert code box. I'm sorry for this, but the, uh, sorry, let me, OK. I'll get to the complication. But first, I want to show you how it works. So you can say, if you use the asterisk, notice I'm using ODOT compose here. I'll explain why in a second. If you use a asterisk, that's a wild card, and that means it matches everything. It matches any, anything in that address space between source and XYZ. Any index number will be matched. So if I do click now, huh? Oh, it's because cause there's only two inputs to, to spat spat. I think if you put make it 16, now there's no error. OK, so now if we click with the asterisk and we open up spat opera again, all of the sources are in that same position. See? I'm sorry, I can't. Can you say briefly why there was an error the first time? Ah, so um, similar to how spat opera needs to know how many sources there are so it knows how to handle it, Spat spat also complains if you send in uh, source values that are outside its range. And so we've said here earlier, we had, I just copied it from yesterday, so it said there were two inputs. And so spat opera is set for 16. So it's sending all these messages that spat spat can't handle. Um, so if I click now, it's going to be all red. And then if I set inputs to 16, which is what we set spat opera to be in here, oops, in the init here. Now it's, it's OK. Now the complication I was going to mention is that um, in ODOT expert code box, the asterisk means multiply. And so I can't actually do this. It's, I think. Yeah, it doesn't know. It doesn't know how to parse that correctly. Yeah, I ran into that problem too. But we're going to help probably divide because divide I thought was right. About yeah. Address. So the way around this, if you need to create a a wildcard address dynamically in ODOT expert code box, you can use the assign function and put it in a string like that, and then then it works. 
anyway, the wild card is cool for that, and, and that will probably come in handy in a minute. OK, so back to our cluster of points. Now, if we remember from yesterday, SPAT is very particular about which messages it, it wants. And so we are going to use, I like actually, my preferred way of dealing with this is to use an identifier in my expression code box that, that identifies the destination of the addresses. So here I'm going to change sources to be SPAT sources XYZ. And then I'm going to make an o.root slash spat. And that will, that, that strip that matches any address that starts with slash spat. And it will strip off that, ad, that uh, address and output everything else. So if we look at the result here, you can see that the output, the input is down here, spat sources XYZ. And the output is just sources XYZ because spat root is removing the, is matching spat and then stripping that part of the address off. And see the, definitely check out the help patch for o.root um, for more information on that. OK, so now, right. OK, so now I'm zooming in. And let's take a look at what's happening. So now I have a bunch of random sources, random positions. But notice that they're all in a little area, right? So that's because the range of jit.noise is between 0 and 1. So what we can do is. Scale that, but where? Where should we do that? Um, let's let's do it in no dot, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to, with your permission, I'd like to encapsulate this spill to X Y Z. It's okay. So JIT spill at plane zero, at plane one, at plane two, going into O dot pack X Y Z. Just need some more space here. OK. All right, I'm just going to get rid of that for a minute. I'm going to get rid of this cell block, too. Hope that's not upsetting anybody. I just need some more space here. OK, so making an o.compose. I'll put a note here what that is just to remember what we're looking at. So we have x, y, z. And we need to scale all of these things to be, be some other value. So at the moment, everything is 0 to 1. So let's, in our o.expr code box, let's scale these. So we'll say, I'm just going to read, I'm going to scale them, but assign it back to its original name. So it's just going to take its current value, scale it, and assign it to the same address on the way up. So I'm going to say x equals scale x. And then, so that's the thing to scale. And the next two arguments are the um, input minimum and maximum. It's just like the maxmsp scale object. So input, we know that the input minimum is 0, and the, mac, the input maximum is 1. And I'm just going to scale that to be I don't know, negative 10 to positive 10 floats. And I'll do that for x, y, and z. So I'm just, I just highlighted the line, copied, and pasted. And now I'm going to update the address to be x, y, z. And now let's check the what happens with that. So now we can see it's much more spread out. Mm -hmm. 
So that's already pretty cool, right? Almost don't even need to play any sound through it. <laughs> that's always my problem, is I always make pretty things that I, and then I'm like, oh, all right, I could put sound through that. This here? Okay. Do you have error messages? Because probably you need to initialize the number of sources to be 16 in the init yeah. subpatch here. So we, I, we changed the number of sources for spat opera to be 16. Okay. Ah, uh, right. So that that I'm doing that in this expert code box over here. So why are you putting spat in and taking spat out? I'm putting spat in because I want to root messages that go to spat. I want to isolate the messages that go to spat from my other uh, messages. So I also have x, y, and z in there. And spat, if I send, if I just send this to spat, it's going to complain that it doesn't know what to do with the x and y and z addresses. Because it doesn't know what they are. It only can talk about, so it has a certain namespace that we can send it for it, that it can understand. As most, most objects are like that, that they have a certain number of messages that they understand and will complain if they get other messages. The, right, the reason, well, I'm, I'm isolating the, this is a kind of a programming technique of, of compartmentalizing different parts of the, of the patch that only do one thing. Uh -huh. So this, right now I am, I would call this a kind of a normalizing or scaling of the input values. Mm -hmm. And then I assign an output address, and that's separate from the thing that interprets it. Now, that's just a useful conceptual model because that means that you have data. So we have input data. So that's this, this JIT noise here. This is our oops, input data. So this input data could be anything. This could be sensors, could be other data. I don't know. It could be data. I mean, data is already a pretty broad word, right? So um, this is data. This is just numbers that come from somewhere. In this case, we're just using random numbers. But for instance, if once we plug in the Boyd's algorithm, that's going to have its own behavior that is compartmentalized into itself. And the values we get out are then are just points, but we're going to use them as data to and apply them to different processes. Mm -hmm. So by compartmentalizing these different uh, processes in the algorithm, we are um, making our lives easier, clearer, hopefully. But wouldn't, wouldn't just connecting the patch port only to the point that it needed to go to also compartmentalize this data? Um, no, because it's not coordinating it. When you, when you start breaking it out, you start, you start losing the relationship between things. So for instance, we don't have to only send things out to spat. We could also say, um, you know, uh, DX7 keyboard, Paul, I don't know, whatever, you know, and then say that's 100. And then up here, we might have some sound, not DX, DX7. We might have a DX7 patch up here. And then we, but that's also coming from, from the same data. And then we route off the DX7 to our DX7. It comes back with audio that goes into SPAT. So you're doing it because we may use the same O dot expression to send it to some other, send other data to some other places. Yeah, so this is basically I am compartmentalizing the part where we map the input data to output data. Mm -hmm. And the input data can be mapped to many places, not just one place. 
Mm -hmm. That means that you are probably clicking on this box. Yeah. Yes. And so unbound means that there is no data associated with X. Actually, that X doesn't exist before you're trying to use it. So code box only evaluates what it's given. You can't click on code box to resend it. It's only a... You, no, you can. But, but look, at, look at this function right here. We are saying scale x, but x doesn't actually exist yet. So this happens first before the assignment. So the first thing that happens is it comes in here, and it's a, we say to ODOT, take x and scale it from 0 to 1 to negative 10 to positive 10. But if it can't find negative x, then it's not going to know what to do. Sure. Yeah. So, so that's why. Right, but if you, if you give it a value, now it's going to complain about y or something. It's, so, so it can scale x, but now it's going to have some other error. So at this point, when I click the bang, I should be seeing a randomized orientation of the chasing Yeah. Right, because we have output from this. So we have the jit.noise. It goes into here. We spill the jitter matrix into O dot. So we have a jitter matrix coming in. And we have jit spill plane 0, plane 1, plane 2 into an O dot pack slash x slash y slash z. And that puts it all together into a bundle. That comes out and goes into the expert code box, which then scales the x, y, z from 0 to 1 to negative 10 to positive 10. And then it interleaves those three lists into a new address called spat sources x, y, z. And then we, in our in the other side of the patch, the patch that's actually doing the rendering, or the sort of performance side of the patch, or the DSP side of the patch, is routing off the spat and sending it to spat opera. And then in spat. Hmm? Yeah, I haven't ah, that's, OK, good, great. OK, cool. So now we are, so now we have that. OK, cool. So this is already pretty interesting. So I have, I have some stuff prepared to, to talk about um, scaling these things so we can then, you know, we can manipulate the whole mass of points. We can stretch it out in X. We can compress it. We can, um, we can also convert it to azimuth elevation distance and then, for instance, scale the distances, offset the distances, scale the azimuths, offset the azimuths. Um, but before we do that, um, let's, let's start listening to to what this sounds like. Because it's, it's interesting already, but it's not, I, I think we'll see in a moment that it's not interesting enough. So I promised yesterday that we would use drum machines today. Um, I'm going to go into the extras. I think this one is good. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, make it stuck! Oh my god. <gasps> Sorry. I panicked there for a second. Are you guys okay? I think it's louder for you. <laughs> I still like drum machines. Um, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> make it stop! <laughs> Okay. <gasps> Whew. I'm having fun. Are you guys having fun? Yes. Okay, good. So we're going to make a new patch here. I'm going to just paste in this 808 patch. So if I turn this down, it should be, should be not too painful. So this is just a kind of a drum machine thing. 
just as an example of like some, we just want some interesting sound to use. So I'm just going to use that. And so now I'm just going to make an outlet. And all of these sounds are mono. So I'm just going to use the leftmost outlet here. Wow, I'm still, I'm still coming down from that. That was pretty intense. OK. <laughs> uh, OK, well, so what's going to happen? Let's just have a, you know, a thought experiment. What's going to happen if I plug this output here? So let's put a scope here. So now the DSP is on, and we have stuff coming out of this, this instrument. So we have a drum machine up here using 808 samples, and it's sending out a bunch of stuff. It's a bunch of um, percussion. So what's going to happen if I plug it into the SPAT? So if we go to SPAT Opera, we see that we have a bunch of sources there. So what, what do you think is going to happen if I plug it in? Let's say I plug it into all of the sources. What's it going to sound like? What do you guys think? Yeah, and it's also well. Let's okay. Let's let's just do it. So I'm going to scale this. Actually, I'll use a um, live gain and turn it way down. And now, oops, not there. Um, I'm going to make a spat five multi connect and say sixteen. And then there's a command, I believe it is the forward slash, no, backslash, which, um, which goes from one thing to many. And I have to turn that DSP off and back on again. OK, so now I'm going to turn up the gain a little bit. Okay, I'm not getting anything. Oh, huh. thank you. <laughs> it's, getting, it's getting to be the end of the week, I guess. Okay, so listen, listen to this. Okay, now I'm just going to hit this random button a couple times. So, yeah, so what, what are we hearing? What, what's going on? Uh, I think it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. A little phasing effect? Yeah. But, but I'm sending the exact same signal to every source. So let's, let's actually, let's use the, um, the wildcard message here to spat opera. Let's say source. So this is o.compose object up here. So I'm saying source star. That means all sources. Aperture. I'm going to set them all to be 10. Because remember, the asterisk means that it matches all indexes. So now all of the apertures are 10. So now you can hear there's a bit less of the room audible. And it's completely, the sound is actually completely correlated in all of the sources. It's exactly the same source going everywhere. There is differences in distance, differences in, in uh, azimuth and elevation, but it's exactly the same sound. So let's do an experiment. Yes? Um, sorry, what, what did you copy and paste into the video? This is um, from the ext uh, in the music and computing time and buffers. Was it just the ISO? Oh, Jesus! You kind of expected it all time. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the ISO rhythm patch. <laughs> I just pasted in the ISO rhythm patch. Um, I, I, Double clicked on the load bang because 
when you copy and paste in Mac, sometimes the load bang doesn't bang, so you have to initialize it. And I went into the set folder name and clicked on this thing here, which then tells uh, Granny Buff where the folder to load is. Yeah. Okay. So I'm doing it. I'm going to keep pushing on here. Okay. So let's. Um, what should we do first? Should we? So basically, my Boyd's thing that I developed uses filters and delays to try to take this single source and spread it to a bunch of sources, but make them all slightly different. So. Let's start with let's start with delay because it's immediate gratification. So I'm going to do not spat five delay, but spat five tap out at channel sixteen. So this has a single Im input and a bunch of outputs, and now I'm going to take my input from live gain and connect it using the exclamation mark from the tap out to the spat spat. And then now we have an opportunity to do some more mapping. Uh, actually, yes, yeah, so let's say in here, let's say spat, ah, oh, shit. All right, so I'm, because I want to use an asterisk, I'm going to use the assign function. So I'm going to say assign spat source star, I wonder if I could do sources. All right. Anyway, there's more than one way to do this, so I'll just do it this way. Why, why would you use the assign? Because the asterisk in O.Codebox code box means multiply. And so I, you have to. What does assign do? And what is what? What does assign do? do? Assign is the same as assignment by, by an equal sign. So, so what we're doing when you use an equal sign is you are assigning a value to an address. Got it. And the assign function does exactly that. It assigns a value to an address. The address is notated just like a regular OSC address, except that you put it in quotes. Ah, so it doesn't try to evaluate the asterisk in the multiple. E exactly, because it's a string. So it's a string. Yeah. So here I'm going to set all of the, the apertures to be 10. So now we don't need that anymore. Uh, but I'll leave it there just for reference. Um, and then let's move this initialization stuff out of the way a little bit. So now I want to set the delays for this tap out. I'm going to move this spat opera over here, I think. And then before spat, I'm going to say, uh, actually, wait, I'm going to say tap out. And I'm going to move this outlet from, so now spat is the second outlet of o.root. root. The rightmost outlet are things that don't match. So now I'm going to connect tap out to the tap out object. And now let's let's do a. How should we do it? What do you think? What should be our delays? Three. So they should all be a sequence of three from the one previous. Okay. Uh, so then, how would we do that? Well, we could say tap out. Okay. Let's let's first see what our namespace is. So first thing we need to do is go to the tap out object, and in here we can see that. Tap out allows you to set all the delays at once in a list with the word delays. So just like we did with spat, I'm going to now assign a new message here, tap out slash delays. And I'm going to generate a list of delays. So let's start by making them all. So with three what? Is that three milliseconds or three seconds? If you don't mind, let's say like 100 milliseconds. It's okay? So let's say we have our delays are a sequence of numbers that are all in their sequence of steps of 100. So how do we do that in ODOT expression? We can say use the aseq function that makes a sequence of numbers. 
Well, our sequence will go from 1 to 16, because we have 16 points. And then we'll multiply that by 100, because each point is in a step of 100. Yeah, that's exactly it. You can do that. Mm -hmm. so you can yeah, hash, a, a pound sign is a um, comment okay. in, in O.Expert. Robin, does O.Expert care about white space? No. In order, right? Order doesn't matter at all. Order? Like if you put the tap out above the other the scale step. It only matters, the order matters, the order is the order that it's evaluated. I see. So oh, it, it matters if you refer to it. In other, in other lines. So, for instance, if I were to refer to tap delays up here, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have created it yet. So it has to be below it. It's just like normal programming. It's going in down, top to bottom. OK. So now I clicked on that. I'm going to double click on the SPAT5 tap out. And I can see now that we have channel 1 delay 100, and it goes from 100 up to 1,600 because we've created a list of numbers from 1 to 16 and multiplied the list by a single value, which then applies that same multiplication to every item in the list and scales the whole list to be 1 to 1,600. So this is going to be cool. Let's see what it sounds like. Ready? So I'm clicking the, the number here. I know that we haven't talked anything about the music and computing stuff, but there's basically this, there's, this is a, sequ a sample rate sequencer um, that's driven from a phase clock. So just for fun, I'm going to use the, the sequence length and trigger a new position for the points at the end of each sequence. So the length of the sequence is defined here in the, whoa, hang on a second. Oops, I lied. This is an ISO rhythm. And that means that there's two different layers moving at different speeds. And instead of using a single phase clock for the whole sequence, I'm using uh, individual clocks. And they have counters that are moving at separate rates. So I'll just have them change position at every beat. Let's see what that sounds like. So we have here a phase click that sends a click out. So here I'm going to make another outlet, outlet two coming out of the phase click. So that's going to send a click out at the end of each, at the downbeat of every beat that's set here. So every 110 milliseconds it's in sync with the, with the sample clock. So that is now the right outlet here. And I'm going to use an edge tilde to convert that click to be a, you know, I'm going to make that the left outlet just because of the way the patch is oriented. So I'm just dragging that outlet to the left. Now it becomes one in the 808 sub patch. And now we have, once I turn the DSP back on, it's beating. <laughs> now it's a random movement. We're also getting interpolation, right? We're getting Doppler. So let's go into SPAT Opera. And we want to turn Doppler off for everybody. So let's go here to our, up here. Let's say source star Doppler zero. Ah, and it's interpolating in the tap out. Well, it, so are you, I'm getting sick. I don't know if you guys are, but it's making me a little nauseous. Um, yeah, that's actually an interesting thing to play with is the interpolation time. So in the, if you double click on the spat tap out, remember that we can 
we can um, see all of the parameters that most SPAT objects, most non-GUI SPAT objects will allow you to see, have a status window and see what the parameters are. And now we can see here, interpolation time is set to 30. I guess I'll, I don't know, I'll set that here. Tap out, interpolation time. And let's just, just for now, I wanna see what that sounds like if we set that to zero. Not impressed. Did I spell it wrong? Interpolation time zero, come on. I, that's spelled right, right? It might be that SPAT doesn't, won't allow you to send in um, both things at the same time in a bundle, which would be pretty lame, but possible. Probably spelled it wrong. Interpolation time. That's spelled right, right? Interpolation time. Maybe it has a minimum interpolation time? Hmm, okay. So it won't let us turn off the interpolation time. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hmm. I don't know. Ah, so it's upper. It was spat upper there. It's too, it's too loud. No, 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 I mean, is that how it's clipping? Oh, it's a clipping. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, because it's red, so. Yeah. Um, so I'm still hearing Doppler. Maybe I have to turn it on. So now it's on, yeah. I turn it off. Is that better? I think it's better now. There might be a bug. I, I think I might have an old, I think it's fixed now. I don't actually have the most recent version of SPAT installed. I'm pretty sure this is fixed, but there was a bug a few months ago where you had to turn the Doppler on and off to turn it off. So I think that's what's happening here. Okay, but I'm pretty, I'm getting happier. So this is pretty interesting already. But now, so at the moment, we have random positions and we have kind of a random delay pattern because we have a, an equally spaced set of delays. Maybe we could make something that captures the spatial information a little bit more. Let's try using some of the spatial parameters to control the delays. So let's say we want the delays to be always moving from left to right. So what we can do is use the X coordinate as our input value for, to generate our, our delays. So now instead of using the sequence, I'm just gonna comment that out. Now I'm gonna say tap out delays equals scale X, which is now, remember, from negative 10 to positive 10. Scale X from negative 10 to positive 10. Actually, to make this even more nice, what we should do is use scale X from the minimum of X to the maximum of X. This way, let's say you don't, you don't know what the input value is and you just wanna scale the whole thing. We can say 
the min and max of x and scale that to 0 to 1600. So it's still going to be the maximum delay time that we were using. How does it know the min and max of x? It will search the list and find that for us. If you go to the help patch for ODA-XFER, there's a functions here and there's statistics. There we go. Statistics, so you can get the length of a list, the average of a list, the mean, which is, I guess, the same thing as the average, and the min-max range. And there's a bunch of other. But x isn't an existing list to the expression box. Ah, it is, yes. Because remember, it's coming in from, so here's what, what's coming in, is a bunch of numbers. Yeah, so every time I click on this, on this JIT noise, it's making a, li a new list. All right. So if I was just sending it the, the single value from a sensor that had a range of 0 to 256 or something, it wouldn't know that. True. I think the min and max would both be the same in that case. It might still work. <laughs> I'm not sure. But it works better with the list. So now we're going to scale. So OK, so yeah, so let's do this. So now we're scaling x to be the delays. So let's see what that sounds like. We're moving it a bit too much. I'm going to not move it all the time. So now it's just, can you hear it? Sounds like it's really over there, huh? So it's not. It's not moving the sources. It's using their positions to scale the delays. So that means that if the delay, if the sources are all to one side, it doesn't, it's still applying the same, the same situation. OK, so another thing we could do is make a grid of points. So I'm going to make this now a 4 by 4 matrix. I don't want to go over 16 channels, so I'm going to stick to a 16 cell matrix. And now I'm going to use um, jit.expr, at expr, and I'm going to make a norm Zero. That means it's going to make a. It's going to normal. It's just going to output zero to one for all the cells in the x-axis, and then for the second value, I'm going to do a norm going in the y-axis, and then I'm going to flatten them all down to zero for the. Are those braces yeah, those are braces. Those are braces. And if you go to the help patch for jit.expr. It's right here. OK, so now if we do this, if I go click and we go to spat upper, they're all in a grid. So now, now when we listen to the delays, we should get more of a lateral movement. It's more equally distributed now. You hearing it? Yeah. And we can bump up the, the delay time. Let's scale it to be, uh, I don't know, three seconds. And let's actually not use this. Um, let's use, just to hear it a little more clearly, let's try just to click. Be a little more clinical here. OK. 
Hello? Very quiet. Very quiet. Okay. A trick with spat upper. So in spat upper, we talk very, very, very briefly about the source presence. Source presence um, is a factor that is adjusted as the source moves closer and further from the listening position, from the, the center of the room, the center of the listening space. It's set from a center radius. And within the radius, it clips the, the value. So um, for instance, let's grab one of these here, like source one. And as I move it closer, see that the, watch the source presence knob. So as I move it away, the source presence goes down. And as I move it closer, the source presence goes up. And notice that the radius here is set to 9.5. And as the source comes, so you can see the distance is down here. As the source comes into 9.5, oh, missed it. I can't even get to 9.5, where is it? Oh, that's interesting. I'm still learning, Spat. I'm never good at the radius thing. Hmm? I've never been good at the radius thing. Uh, <laughs> um, so there, there are parameters here for describing how the sound drops off. The idea of the radius is that there's a certain distance that when the source comes closer than the radius, it, it doesn't get any louder than what it is set at when it is at the edge of the radius. So that's something that you have to set. So what you can do is do something like set all of the distances of all of the sources to be 1 using the star. So I say, oops, yeah, that's in the speaker. OK. So I'm actually going to add it to this initialization O dot message there. Get rid of this guy. Oops. Okay. Okay, so we're setting the aperture for everybody. And I'm also going to say source star distance is 1. That's important because um, when you set the presence, it's dependent on the distance of the source at that moment. If you want to adjust the distance for a source, you need to put it at the closest if you, if you want, when you set the source presence for it to be the maximum value, it should be at the radius of, of what you've set for that source. So maybe I'll add a line here like source star radius is 1, and the source distance is 1, and the source star pres is 120, I think, is the maximum value. So now if I click that and look in the spat upper, they've all moved to be a distance of 1. And they all have a radius of 1 meter. And the source presence is 120 for all of them. They look a little funny here because they all have different um, uh, heights and elevations. Ah, actually, I don't want to scale the z to be negative 10, because our speaker array doesn't go negative. So I'm going to scale the z axis to be between 0 and 10. So now if I click on that and I go back here, I believe it might be a little louder. So when I do the click, it's still really quiet. But you can hear, kind of. <laughs> I'll turn it up a little bit. Right, so it's going through, and if you notice, it's 1, it's 4, right? Do you remember? Why, why would that be? Why is it 4 clicks? Exactly. So we're using the exposition for the delays, but there's many of them have the same x coordinate. Because we, did this grid. because we did this grid, exactly. So now if we um, 
take out this uh, grid and we just go directly from the JIT noise into here. We click that. Now if we look back at the opera, now we have a more complicated design. And now check the difference. To my ears, it sounds like they're kind of all over the place. Are they, are they moving from X to Y, or X over? Doesn't seem like that, does it? Let's scale our Y values to be something much smaller, like zero to one. So now if I look in here, basically they're all going along the X axis. not cool. I mean, it's still kind of cool, but it's not as cool as it should be. So let's just take a look at the numbers here. So it looks like the third from last value in my tap out delays is zero. So that should be the lowest number in the list. And then if I go to the X, I see one, two, three is at negative eight, which does look like it's the lowest X value. Let's try, I don't understand that. Let's try panning type, let's try uh, VBAP 3D. It does seem like it's moving, but it seems to be moving from over here to over there, right? Oh. Well. It looks like speaker 12. Hmm. Well, I'm confused. And that's part of, that's part of doing this stuff too is, you know, there's a lot of, things that can go wrong. And sadly, even if you have a cool idea, it doesn't always come out the way you want it to. So if I were here doing, uh, if I was composing something and I really wanted this to work, I would uh, just be quiet for a long time and go step by step to fig try to figure out what, what was not working here. But due to lack of time right now, I don't, I'm not sure that we'll be able to figure that out in, while we're here. But we can listen to this drum thing. Um, and it's kind of cool. I mean, you get the idea that if I just do a little burst, I mean, it is moving through the space. I mean, as far as I can tell, everything looks right. The speaker coordinates are Sounds like it's passing diagonally through the space. Yes. It does. So there may be some orientation problem somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure where that is. Could you show us how to like, modify one of those parameters that has the asterisks? Like, say you wanted to have a knob that rides the presence for yeah. all of the surfaces. Yeah. Like, Actually, well, you could do something like use o.pack and say, source star, it's just o.expr that has that problem with the, it uses the asterisk for multiplication. You could um, do o.pack source slash star slash aperture. Yeah. 
That's one way to do it. You could um, use uh, the, you could make a, also use the o.gui attach if you wanted to, have like an interface. Um, Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. And then you could just put it right here. Does it have to, so it doesn't have to go into the... You have to spell it right, that's a problem. That's actually a patch that I prepared to show you. Which is here. So here's, here's a, a patch, a, basically an interface to scale and offset in XYZ and azimuth elevation distance. There's also a SPAT5 uh, transform object, which is good for that. Um, but if you want to get more nitty gritty and more um, experimental, maybe it's worth just doing it in ODOT because then you, it's not that hard. Um, the main thing is you have to, if you want to do both azimuth elevation distance and XYZ operations, you have to convert after one or the other. So in this case, I'm taking in XYZ values scale and offset them in XYZ, then convert them to the azimuth elevation distance, and then also can scale them post um, after having already scaled the XYZ values. So what I'm doing here is I, this um, question, question equals means, um, like Seth, you saw before, when, when if something's not there, it throws an error. So in this case, I say that, or sorry, question, question equals means does this message already exist? If so, use what's already there. If not, give it this default value. And that's pretty useful in cases where you really are relying on a value, and, but you don't know if it's going to be there yet or not. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm just going to copy this patch and then put it in this patch, I'm going to put it before our mapping. So I'm going to call this uh, transform. Oops. Ah. Okay. Okay. So in here, I have a bunch of, um, of values. Another cool thing with the O.GUI GUI attach is it makes it easy to, to do presets. It works a bit like the pattern system, but it's in ODOT, so you have some more flexibility. Um, so all these values are attached and coming out of this GUI attach. And then you can also um, make a copy of, you know, grab a, alt click, drag a copy of this. And then you can store that value and set them later. So that's pretty handy. Um, so let's go and plug this in. So now I'm going to, I'm not going to scale them. Well, OK, hang on. What do we want to do here? Let's go back to our original scaling. But I'm going to separate this out. I'm actually going to put this in the, in the data generation patch. So now when it comes out of this um, patch where we go out of jitter into ODOT, it's going to already have scaled everything. So we don't have to think about it in our mapping zone. So now when, when we get 
the values out of jitter. Let's look at that. Now we have the x, y, and z scaled from negative 10 to positive 10. Then it's going to go into our transform. No, oh, getting some errors probably. Dist is unbound. Okay, so I have some bug in here. Distance is unbound. Yes, that should be D. Okay, so now we have, ooh, Nan, yum. Uh, D is zero because the default scale, huh? D should not be zero. Scale, scale Z is 10, let's make this scale one. So I'm going to make the default scale. So the scale is just a multiplier. So the default should be 1. OK, so these max and min things we're not using. I'm going to take those out. Uh, scale A, E, D are not present. Also. Thanks for your patience. So the z's are all zero for some reason. That's weird. Why are the z's zero? The scale z is one. Does anybody see anything I'm doing wrong here? Basically, I'm saying take this offset value and add it to there. Oh, it's because over here, I, I haven't. There are values coming in, and they're 0. OK, so these, these need to be all 1s. All the scaling needs to be 1. And then I'm going to make a copy of that. The offset will be 0. And now I'm going to make a copy of this state of these, uh, my interface that I made here. I'm going to make a copy of that, and I'm going to load bang that when the patch loads to set the values of all of these, these guys over here. And I'm going to encapsulate that, Shift-Command-E, and call it init. So basically, I just set these scales to be 1. OK. So now, OK, that makes more sense. Great. So now we can put that into the back into our ODA expert code box. And ah. Come on. So now it's we still have these XYZs. Um, but if we go look in the transform. The, actually, the azimuth elevation distance are the most, are at the bottom of the computation. So we're starting with x, y, z, and then we are also converting the AED. So the AED are, is actually the last most um, thing that was computed. So actually, we probably need to convert that back to x, y, z at the end there. But for now, let's just talk about azimuth elevation distance. So instead of doing spat sources x, y, z, I'm going to do spat sources a, e, d, and now do an interleave with a, e, d instead. Because I just want to check to make sure that our thing is working. OK, so now we have that up there. I'm going to go into our transform. And Right now, the o dot, I'm using o.union to join two different bundles together. It takes a bundle that's in the right inlet and adds it to the bundle that comes into the left inlet and outputs one bundle that contains everything together. If there's something in, that comes in in the left inlet that has the same address as something that's in the right inlet, it prefers the left inlet. And I want well, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that I want to now manipulate these scalings and update the source positions as I do it. 
I guess what I'm actually going to do is not use o.union, but use o.acume, which, if you double click, is actually just a, an abstraction that whenever a new bundle comes in, it goes through a trigger and sets the o.union with the previous bundle and then outputs the new bundle. And so that way, if new OSC addresses comes in, it always updates the new one and then stores its current value. So it's, it's accumulating messages. Very useful. OK, now I'm going to load bang this. We get an error because x is unbound, because we're accumulating. But I'm OK with that for right now. So now when I click this, now we have the x, y, z positions. And now if we look at the spat offer over here and start manipulating these things, we can start start seeing. So hopefully now if I scale the distance, all of the sources are getting closer and going more distant. So let's turn on the audio, because it's more fun that way. And, and let's, instead of using the delays, let's use um, azimuth. I mean, instead of using x, let's use the azimuth. And actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a, another I'm going to add something to this transformation. I'm actually, this transformation patch is going to be an, is actually my, going to be my interface. And so now I'm going to make a new one, a new float here and change its name to be max delay, max delay time, just max delay. I'm going to click on that. Hello. Huh? Looks like I found a bug. Huh? Ah, <sighs> man. Sometimes o.gui attach doesn't update. This is something I've noticed lately. If I bang it, then it updates. So I, I'm going to fix it. That's why it's in the dev folder. OK, but now, now the max delay shows up there. So that. Get that passes that through this bundle. Hopefully, when the patch restarts, it will find it. OK, so now in my interface, I'm sending out a max delay time. So now in my, so I'm going to change this transform. Oops, I'm going to call it, ah, oh man, transform UI, because I, now I have a user interface in there. And now my max delay is going to be a variable, max delay. So now we can play with that max delay time. So you see, when the delay time gets really short, it's, it's so short that it becomes almost like an early reflection. So it's blending into the attack of the sound. So it's, it's short enough so that the, the delays are fusing with the direct source. And as you increase the delay time, they start to separate. Go back to 100 milliseconds. And then, uh, 
Um, so now we can use all of the scaling to scale the entire swarm of points, which it will then, you know, depending on the azimuth, the order of the delays will change. But it's always going to be, it's using the, the azimuth to, to set the order of the delays. So um, for instance, if we change that to be the elevation, hypothetically, the delays should always go up, upwards. So it should always be starting from the ground level and going upwards. So now maybe it'll be easier if I just like make a little attack. And I'll increase I'll increase the delay time to be something like the maximum delay time will be one second. So you hear how it's going upwards? Uh, so I, yeah, I have, I have a gen version of this that has the feedback, but it's not quite as easy to plug in as this. So I, yeah, but yeah. So then, what I wanted to show you was that with these. So let's let's keep that looping, I guess. Um, and we're so now if we adjust these scaling and offset values. So now I'm, I'm pushing them all into the distance, bringing them closer. Ah, and so now we're using the the elevation, right, to to for the delays. So now if, let's scale the delays and increase the 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 scaling. Actually, let's also uh, in this this viewer here, let's look at. Um, Now we can see the the distribution of the sounds. If we if you go to the sorry, if you go in the spat opera, there's a little um, wrench here, and it opens up a display, and you can set it to have um, double view. So now we can see the the elevation as well as the the um, should be. Uh, I think I, I actually don't have the most recent version. I think <laughs> I don't know. I'm at five point X. Well, but there's you can also um, if you use Spat Viewer, that should also give you the option to do that. But anyway, the point I wanted to just look at perceptually, um, if we look at this this vertical distribution, since we have our delays now um, using the elevation as our delay. Uh, mapping function, um, and we go into our, our transformation thing here, I'm going to scale the, the delays, or scale the elevation. So here, if I, if I reduce the scale, it makes them all down low. And if I scale it up, it brings them upwards. Um, but we're scaling, notice that here we're scaling the minimum elevation to the maximum elevation to be zero to the max delay. So that means that the list of delays is always going to be between zero and the maximum delay. Now there's this, a different kind of behavior we might want, which is that when I squish all the points down to be towards the horizontal layer, we might want to have less delays. And as you expand the points up towards the, the ceiling, we might want a larger distribution of delays. So in that case, we don't want to scale between the minimum of elevation and maximum of elevation. We want to scale between 0 and 90, because 0 elevation will be on the, on the uh, what do you call that, when you look off into the sea, the horizon. Mm -hmm. And the other one will be up, upwards. OK, so let's go quickly for our last finale. So now we're scaling from 0 to 90 to 0 to max delay. And now 
in our UI, I'm going to play with the elevation, which will simultaneously change the spatial location and also the delay pattern that's being put into the sources. And it's fun if you go if you <laughs> if you go above one, it starts wrapping around, which is kind of fun. Hopefully that gives you a place to start um, thinking about how you might deal with multiple sources. I guess I have one more thing I want to show you, which is that, so you see now they're all, they're all distributed here, but with our transform we can also do things like offset them and have them, this whole swarm, kind of come off from a distance. So now they're all, I, it sounds like they're over there. I don't know, there's some sort of orientation issue somewhere, but it's still kind of working, so I think it's okay. So now I'm going to, I'm going to bring the sources over, over you. So you can have a, a cluster of points that, that comes and then surrounds you and then moves off. Um, and that's just simply adding, all I'm doing is adding an offset to the x values for all of the this, this sources. And that's what's very convenient if you store all of your coordinates in a list in, in ODOT, you can simply add one number and it scales the entire list. And so that's why having your, your, perceptual, your perceptually linked values, if they are clearly labeled, you can operate on them as a whole and then have a perceptual result. Okay, any last questions before we wrap up? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be something a little bit new, mm -hmm. which is uh, spat monitoring in headphones. Oh. Yes. Great. Okay. No, I just don't understand how it knows which are going to top out and which are going to spot from the transform UI. Ah, so the trans. Um, well, so I'm any. Speaking to delays, is that how? No. Say again? Yeah, no, I just didn't quite understand the messaging, how that works. Well, the transform is taking the XYZ values and transforming them. Uh, let's take a quick look at that patch. But I just Um, well, the way the ODOT root works is that it, it matches the anything that's slash tap out. So here's, here's what's coming out of the, out of here, is this bundle. And you can see down here at the bottom, we have, we have those, those values. Binaural. I would suggest, um, I think there's probably some good tutorials on that. Um, there is a, there's an option which is called Spot Virtual Speakers. Uh, ah, yeah. Um, so you just give the output stream of what you get out of spots, five spots, for example. You make a parallel stream, you maybe you can pick the option. Oh, let's put a spots dot virtual. Five virtual. Speakers. 
campfire. So here you see it's very easy. Um, you just have the object which is called virtual speakers. You put in the speaker coordinates and then um, you can set up here the HDFs which you use, uh, which use the Solmat Sofa. Um, so if you have your own HDFs in Sofa format, you just can, just can feed them in there. So if you ever get the chance to get your, virtu uh, your personal HDFs method, go and do it. Um, and so what's, what this object is doing is just your actual speaker setup is convolved with the corresponding HDF so that you sit virtual in the room. And then there um, is another options, I think. Options. It goes down to the left, uh, middle, middle of the patch. Yeah, yeah right options. There. Where you can say, OK, we know that for externalization, the ground reflection is very important. So we simulate it. So you can have a room setting. Um, somewhere there's the ground reflection. So you add a ground reflection that you get a better externalization without distortion of your reverberation setting. If the sound is still here, then you can add some reverberation with some simple presets and so on. So it's rather easy with this approach to virtualize your actual speaker setting on headphones. Um, I would just add, so yeah, in that patch, the, the SPAT 5 binaural setups is a little different from SPAT 4. Everything is using this um, SPAT sofa loader to, uh, to get the HR. And it has a slash HRTF message is how you set that up. So SPAT sofa is a standardized format, um, which is AES69, so standardized with the Audio Engineering Society. And it comes with the dot sofa, um, which has many advantages. And you can directly be slash HDF and you give the name to your sofa file if you have one. You just drag and drop it there, you see drop sofa file here, and you feed it into the object as HDF and it's automatically find the best match to the this interpolation of the HDF so you can virtualize the speaker setup. And you can also use um, the sofa HRTFs with um, spat pan and spat spat to do direct bi binaural panning. If you're just doing headphone mixes um, and don't need ambisonic uh, domain representation. representation, thank you, <laughs> uh, then you can just go ahead and you directly use the binaural um, rendering, which can quite often be a bit more uh, higher resolution because it's, it's a pretty high resolution. Um, generally speaking, the HRTFs are a pretty high density sampling in the space. Basically, it's the sofa loader. And if you were to go to the spat spat help file, I'm guessing there's a binaural example in here. Yes. So on the tabs up here, there's a tab here on for binaural. And here's the sofa loader here. So just like that other, uh, just like the virtual speakers uh, object, you can set the HRTF in the same way. And the main important thing here is that you need to set the panning type to be binaural. So you get all information about the sofa format. That's a discussion platform. Um, so the speci specifications, which are the standard, the conventions. So which show sofas, uh, which kind of like free field HDF and whatever exists. But here, uh, what's nice, it gives a link to all the different platforms. We even haven't added yet ours. So you can, that's all freely available HDFs. So you can download them um, because when we defined the standard, we collaborated with many different labs, including New York University in Japan, a couple of labs, KAIS, and so all over the world, the TU Berlin, um, so it's a quite nice collection of HDFs. And then there should be a server which is called OpenDAP. So OpenDAP is a server protocol which is used with the SOFA format. And what you're searching for are simple free field HRIRs, so head related impulse responses. They're collected from three different projects Cross Mode, Listen, and Billy. Listen is the oldest one. Bill is the newest one, and here you see free field compensated HDFs 
they come in 96 kilohertz, um, so you can downsample them, or you get the interpolated, which come in mm. um, three different sampling rates, so 48 kilohertz, for example, and here you can download the files as a sofa file. And they're very high resolution, I think it's 2,800 points around the head. So if you search for some HDFs, just browse them, and um, it's quite nice to try several of them to see how it affects your um, how the pad localization or localization accuracy, and so on. Okay, well, thank you guys. I think that wraps us up for today.